topic for presentation here today is classical anarchist thought and the hope for social reorganization. Uh, when I just try to uh, deal with the uh, concept of social reorganization and classical anarchist thinking, and for that matter, I have chosen to deal with uh, classical anarchists like Bakunin and Kropotkin for, for the reason uh, that they were directly involved with the working class movement. And uh, Kropotkin, uh, to a greater extent, actually theorized anarcho-communism. And uh, I would like to begin with a quotation um, from Kropotkin's work, Modern Science and Anarchism, where he actually says that it's important not just to uh, destroy the state, destroy the uh, authoritarian institutions, but it's also equally important to have in mind a concrete uh, guideline as to how the future uh, society, the future post-revolutionary uh, anarchist society is going to be organized. This is something that he actually clearly outlines in his modern science and anarchism. And uh, he calls it the ideal, the conception of something better that uh, any critique of the social existing social institutions would have in mind. So it's important to have the element of destruction uh, at one point. And coupled with that, it's also important to have the constructive element that is how to reorganize the post-revolutionary society. Now, uh, to begin with, I would like to talk a little bit about the International Working Men's Association because it's important to take into consideration the founding of this particular forum in 1864 because of the fact that Bakunin and Kropotkin both uh, functioned within the first international. And uh, this uh, forum was created to achieve the unity and solidarity of the working men and their emancipation. And uh, this uh, was very clearly enshrined in the uh, as the first objective uh, of the uh, in first international uh, at the world, first international uh, at its first congress held in Geneva in 1866. Uh, now, with regard to Bakunin and his entry into the first international, uh, it needs to be taken into consideration that we see Bakunin as uh, a libertarian socialist who is considered to be the founder of the international anarchist movement and who vociferously championed the need to uh, ensure individual and collective liberty and justice. So uh, while he was actually uh, talking about his collectivist anarchism within the international, he was actually making a critique of the authoritarian socialism of Marx. And uh, coupled with that, as a natural corollary, came the conceptualization of libertarian socialism. So as I see it, Bakunin's collectivist anarchism uh, was essentially a response to Marxism. Prior to his entry into the first international, uh, Bakunin, at the League of Peace and Freedom held in Bern, 1868, he categorically stated why he hated communism, because for him, Communism denoted something that was essentially uh, connected with the institution of the state. And uh, where the, uh, all the resources, uh, everything was utilized for the state itself. Everything was centralized under the state. But he was talking about the need for the abolition of the state. And coupled with that, he was also talking about the future post-revolutionary anarchist society, where all the resources, all the forces of uh, production, uh, labor, everything would be collectively organized. And in that regard, he said that I'm a collectivist, but not a communist. Now with that, he established and confirmed his stand as a collectivist at the Basel Congress of the International Working Men's Association. And he also stated that there's the need for the abolition of the twin instruments of exploitation as well that are perpetuated by the institution of the state itself. They are the landed property and the law of inheritance. Now, how did Bakunin visualize revolution and anarchist social organization? So for Bakunin, there was the need to demolish all authoritarian institutions at the onset of the social revolution. That could be the state, the church, or capitalism for that matter. And the proletariat peasantry and the Lumpen proletariat would have an important role to play in that. So while talking about uh, the organization of workers, how they would be organized, from where they would be conducting the revolution, he uh, emphatically stated that workers needed to be organized into trade unions or trade associations, and they would have to use general stri strikes as a very effective weapon uh, for revolutionary activities. So at the onset of the revolution, there would be expropriation of wealth, and this wealth would be collectively owned, and the future society, anarchist society, would be organized on the basis of the principles of federalism and collectivism from the bottom up. And there would be workers' cooperatives, which would again be uh, organized into a worldwide economic federation. Bakunin's collectivist anarchist position, as I see it, and also uh, many of the historians have actually dealt with it, uh, was essentially a result of his uh, supposed polemical conflict with Marx and his critique of Marxism, 
where the question of the state became very important. So Bakunin, uh, the very concept of state was anathema to Bakunin. Uh, he said that uh, it could be the transitory, in, it, it could be in the transitory uh, phase as well, phase of the revolution, but he was averse to any, uh, to the uh, establishment of a proletarian state as well. So there was a distinction that he was making between political and social revolution, and he made a critique of the conquest of power. The working class need, need not uh, wield uh, political power, did not need to conquer political power in the course of the revolution, because it would lead to the dictatorship of the proletariat and the creation of a people's state or a folk state. So it would result in the creation of a new aristocracy, as for him, there was this intrinsic and a very crucial link between class power and state. Now, uh, when these developments were taking place within the first international, we find that uh, one, uh, and, and also during the course of his uh, supposed polemical conflict with Marx, we find that it resulted in the expulsion of Bakunin and his disciple James Guillaume from the international in 1872. And even prior to that, there was the formation of the Jura Federation and the workers of the Jura Federation uh, were very much uh, inclined towards the collectivist anarchist uh, ideas of Bakunin. And after the expulsion of Bakunin and James Guillaume, we find there was this uh, establishment of the anti-authoritarian international by the anarchists. Now, uh, in the congresses of the anti-authoritarian international from 1874 onwards, we find that there were many important issues that were taken up. For example, the question of workers' at, uh, autonomy, the question of social revolution, federalism, collectivism, how to organize workers. So in a series of uh, congresses, these ideas were actually discussed, these ideas were taken up. So all of it reflected the also the concern that the anarchists had with regard to uh, the question of revolution and also organizing the post-revolutionary anarchist society. Following that, there was again this blending, a very interesting blending of the two concepts of anarchy and communism. And this happened at the Congress of the Jura Federation where Peter Kropotkin also played a very important role along with Carlo Pofiero. So it was uh, stated categorically that it was possible to bring together these two concepts and there was actually no conflict between the two. Because for them, communism essentially uh, implied free communism, where there would be no proletarian state, there would be no state in the transitory phase of the revolution, even if it was a worker state for that matter. Along with this, there was another important development that was taking place at the end of the 19th century, and that was the rise of revolutionary syndicalism, where the organization of workers and the trade unions became increasingly important, and also anarcho-syndicalism, which became an effective uh, movement in the first half of the 20th century. Definitely for the anarcho-syndicalists, the uh, very uh, unit, I mean, the trade unions uh, should not be used only for revolutionary activities by the workers, but also uh, they should be used as uh, basic units into which the workers would be organized, the agrarian uh, communities, as well as the industrial communities would be organized in the uh, anarchist society in the post-revolutionary period. So libertarian communism became the main ideological foundation for both these uh, very important currents of anarchism in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Much later in the course of the Spanish uh, revolution, we find that Isaac Puente, he said that libertarian and communism, these two terms, they can actually be blended. And they would, if blended, they would signify the uh, bringing together of the two concepts of collectivism and individual freedom. So communism essentially for uh, the anarcho-communists, entailed freedom. So there would have to be freedom of the individual freedom, not just individual freedom, but also collective freedom. Now, this concept of anarcho-communism came to be discussed in the anti-authoritarian international from the 1876 onwards. And of course, we had uh, the theorization of anarcho-communism at the hands of Peter Kropotkin, Carlo Cofuro, and Elise Reclou. And we find that there was a significant shift that was being made from Bakunin's collectivism to anarcho-communism. And this was, again, with regard to the distribution of the produce in the post-revolutionary anarchist society. That is something that I'll uh, deal with a little later in my presentation. Now, if we move on to Kropotkin from uh, the conceptualization and theorization of anarcho-communism, it's important because Kropotkin himself was also functioning within the international and the anti-authoritarian international in particular. For him, anarchism was the no government form of socialism. So again, for him also, there would have to be expropriation at the onset of the revolution. There would have to be the abolition of the authoritarian political and economic structures and the conquest of bread. So food for him was essentially important because in the revolutionary period, everything would come to a standstill. So you would have to provide food to the revolutionaries, to the people who were actually trying to overhaul the existing system. So it would essentially lead to the communalization of food, dwellings, and clothing, meaning that there would have to be communalization of production, distribution, and exchange. So for Kropotkin, anarchism, how did he see social organization? For him, anarchism was a creative force. 
it was a constructive power of the people themselves. So society in the post-revolutionary period for Kropotkin would have to be organized along the lines of communistic anarchy, which would ensure well-being for all people who were part of that uh, communist anarchist society. And there would be these free groups uh, that would be formed within this uh, society, and there would be fa free federations of these free groups that would be constituted. And they would again, like reiterating uh, uh, Bakunin, there would be collective ownership of the means of production and produce. So free agreement and free cooperation would become the basis of the future anarcho-communist society where mutual cooperation and mutual aid would play a very important role. And together with this was uh, what was ve very important uh, in Kropotkin's uh, ideas, the way he actually formulated his critique of collectivism was uh, his vociferous uh, emphasis on the need to abolish the wage system itself, because he said that it's not possible to evaluate uh, the amount of labor that a particular individual puts in uh, to produce a particular commodity in terms of the hours that he puts in to uh, produce that commodity. So the collectivist wages system had to be abolished altogether. And there would be production in abundance, and this produce would be distributed in accordance with the principle of to each according to his needs. So that was the kind of communist society that he envisaged in the post-revolutionary period. Again, in these free uh, federations and these free associations, there would have to be space for individual action and initiative as well. So there would not be any kind of suppression of the initiatives or the individual uh, uh, identities of the, uh, of, of the people who were involved, of the people who were a part of that uh, anarcho-communist society, because the ultimate objective was to ensure economic and political liberty. Kropotkin was a witness to the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, and for him, the Soviets or the workers' councils that came into being, that controlled the economic and political life of Russia was an excellent idea, because that was something that the anarchists were trying to uh, talk about. However, he made a, uh, a trenchant critique of the strong centralized state communism of uh, the Bolshevik state that came into being after the in the, the uh, post-October 1917 period. And for him, he uh, categorically stated that the Russian Revolution was essentially an example of how not to introduce communism. Uh, and uh, for him, he, he felt that the fact that the creation of, of a centralized state structure would essentially lead to a reduction in the efficacy of peasants and workers' councils because they should be functioning all by themselves without any kind of centralized state uh, control. So for him, social revolution and centralized party dictatorship were absolutely contradictory. Now we find that these uh, uh, ideas of both Bakunin and Kropotkin uh, and the way they perceived uh, revolution, the way they uh, uh, talked about uh, social reorganization in the post-revolutionary period, the kind of, I would not say a blueprint because they were just outlining the guidelines as to how it could be uh, created. They were not actually theorizing. Bakunin was definitely not theorizing. Kropotkin to a larger extent theorized. But uh, the ideas of Bakunin and Kropotkin's uh, you know, uh, pertaining to uh, social reorganization in the post-revolutionary period resurfaced in the context of the uh, Russian Revolution of 1970s. So the first uh, instance of libertarian alternatives would be the case of Russia, where there was this critique of the centralizing tendencies of the Bolshevik state by both the anarcho-communists and the anarcho-syndicalists. And the later anarchists in Russia in particular, and also elsewhere, they were actually talking about the alternate libertarian organization, which uh, they did, keeping in mind the ideas of uh, Bakunin and Kropotkin and also the uh, idea as to uh, how the workers needed to be organized. So they emphasized, especially the anarcho-communists in this regard, they emphasized on the need to organize workers into trade unions or syndicates or workers' cooperatives, like the uh, anarcho-communists did, into a free federation of communes. So this is where Bakunin and Kropotkin's ideas became all the more relevant in the context of the developments that were taking place in the first half of the 20th century. Libertarian alternatives also took place uh, in Spain and uh, uh, in the course of the Spanish Civil War, where the anarchists played a very, very important role. And what we find is that in historical perspective, Bakuninist influence in Spain was very important because his influence and his activities led to the founding of the Spanish section of the First International. And uh, at times, you know, there, there are these uh, comparisons that are made between the Spanish Revolution, hailed as uh, the Libertarian Social Revolution on the one hand, and the Bolshevik Revolution, hailed as the Political Revolution. So workers' uh, self-management or workers' control in industries and agriculture was very important during these experiments of, uh, with regard to the collectives that were formed. And uh, there was this unique coordination between the rural collectives and the socialized uh, enterprises, both agriculture and uh, in the realm of industry. 
that actually took place during the uh, Spanish Revolution of 1936 uh, uh, to 1939. And these collectives again functioned on the basis of mutual cooperation and free agreement, definitely, and also the principle of mutual aid, which was very important. Again, uh, bringing uh, to the fore uh, Kropotkin's ideas pertaining to uh, free cooperation, free federation of communes, uh, mutual aid and mutual cooperation. A very interesting account of Gaston Leval with regard to the Spanish experiment that I have uh, included in my presentation here today. Uh, I, I won't be reading out the entire thing, but I'll just uh, highlight the important points that I want to in this particular um, extract that I've taken. He actually, uh, made an account of the experiment in Spain that was going on pertaining to the collectives that came into being, where uh, there were village collectives, there were, there were factories that were uh, collectivized, there were socialized industries, and this represented the constructive work of the Spanish Revolution. So what he uh, highlighted was that uh, more than 60% of the land was collectively cultivated by the peasants themselves. And this was not to increase production. There were no landlords, there were no bosses, uh, and without instituting capitalist, uh, capitalist competition to spur production. So in industries, factories, mills, workshops, everywhere, you had these revolutionary committees, you had the syndicates uh, functioning that administered production, they conducted production, and production definitely increased to a very great extent, especially in the uh, agrarian sector, and public services were also provided. And then he also uh, stated that uh, the industrial and agrarian collectives, they uh, implemented the communist principle of uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And this was very significant because this was this important shift that had taken place within the first international from collectivism to anarcho-communism. And this was something that was implemented in the course of the Spanish revolution of 1936 to 1939. And uh, there was free association. And what we find is that this principle, the practice of mutual aid was brought to the fore. It was something that resulted in the solidarity of the workers. So to conclude my presentation, uh, what I think is important to take into consideration is the fact that anarchy or anarchism, it does not necessarily imply chaos or disorder. It is something that also stands for order. Because what we find is that in this regard, Bakunin and Kropotkin's contribution is very important because they were actually talking about future, uh, the, the, the future society. They were actually providing guidelines as to how this could be reorganized. So it was not just destruction. It was also something creative in its own right. And anarchism and organization, I think they're absolutely compatible because you actually have something to think about, something to bring about in the post-revolutionary period. And especially in the context of Russia and Spain, we find that anarchist social reorganization, it provided a libertarian alternative. And it created, it generated this hope for stateless socialism. And most importantly, I consider anarchist uh, theory of social reorganization and anarchism as a practice itself to be essentially constructive in nature because it provides with a constructive vision for future society. That is all that I would like to say. And this is uh, the last quotation that I have in my presentation from Kropotkin's Anarchist Communism, Its Basis and Principles, where he says that there's no need for us to actually uh, think of anarchy or anarchism in terms of disorder because uh, having no government doesn't mean that there is uh, disorder and uh, having a strong government or a police doesn't mean that it's very beneficial uh, for the people who are actually a part of that uh, society. So both implications, according to him, and I quote him, both implications, however, are anything but proved. Thank you very much.